That's fine. Uh, yeah, I'm Sarah Hoover. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Galway in Ireland. <laughs> and I'm here because um, my postdoc is actually part of the CLS Infra project. CLS Infra is Computational Literary Studies Infrastructure, um, which is a European Research Council Horizon 2020 project involving over 35 researchers at 13 institutions in the EU. I and my project are, are both new to the LD4 community, so I'm, I'm kind of here to introduce us, highlight a couple of our outputs that intersect with the LD4 mission, and hopefully um, find out from everyone what is the most useful or how best to offer it into the library data sector. So um, we work to develop and bring together resources of, of high quality data, tools and knowledge to aid approaches to studying literature in the digital age, as well as linguistics. We tend to have a lot of overlap there. We operate, um, Everything according to the FAIR data principles and linked open data is therefore an important part of everything we do, including training toolkits, resource reviews, um, and other outputs. There we go. <laughs> As we approach our final year of the project, uh, we're scheduled to end in February of 2025, though we're probably extending for more conferences. Um, we're also reversing that vision and asking how the, the data, tools, and knowledge within CLS can be used for research outside the fields of literature and linguistics. In particular, what we found over the past four years is that archivists, librarians, um, data scientists, and li library scientists have come to our training schools, been involved with our workshops and, and other project outputs, and found some of those outputs to be very useful resources, either for themselves or for the people they work with. So besides people, the CLS, uh, Computational Literary Studies in Ecosystem, consists of resources such as text collections for drama, poetry, and prose in several languages, uh, tools, methods, models, and what I find most useful, accessible reviews of the existing tools, methods, and models trying to bring together um, what's already out there. And then um, we have some deep methodological and theoretical considerations that pair with our training and, and um, we support a fellowship program. <laughs> so, um, in those, we are trying to work with existing best practices, uh, trying to create um, standards or to highlight existing standards that we think are going to be uh, ever more useful in our changing data landscape. So I wanna talk specifically about just a couple of things. We do have a lot of outputs. Um, and we will have more to come, as I say, in February, that's our scheduled end date. So we should have all of these things that you see on the screen by that time. <laughs> all of these are available on our website. They're also on Zenodo and um, linked through Zotero to our library, also found on our website. So of particular interest to the LOD community, um, might be the development of the CLS core model for describing corpora. Our working groups, um, particularly some out of Potsdam and Vienna, have been surveying the landscape of literary corpora and cataloging the set of tools used in the field. Their most recent deliverable, which is 6.3, offers a comprehensive overview of common formats for encoding textual data beyond just TEI in both literary and linguistic computational fields. Because we consider interoperability an absolutely necessary key to reusability, that deliverable explores conversion between formats. This um, and other deliverables out of those working groups are all in service to the creation of the CLS core model which is planned for release in February, 2025. Though if that is of interest to anyone, I can connect you to the people who are working on it now. 
Some of the other deliverables are perhaps of more general interest, and I would appreciate any feedback on um, what is of use and how maybe to communicate that. <laughs> um, one of the more popular here is our matrix of methods. Um, many, this is a actually an interactive matrix on our website. So someone interested in, for example, authorship attribution, but new to um, data humanities methods, digital humanities methods, could see a bibliography and a summary explanation of how to build an annotate, an how to build a corpus, annotate it, analyze it, evaluate the results. <clears throat> so a lot of people have found this very helpful to share with um, folks who are changing their methods or beginning a new journey into CLS. Thank you for the time check. We also have uh, training schools and the material from the training schools is um, all available on the Daria campus. We've had three, the most recent is not shown here. That was in Vienna and was particularly focused on linked open data and literary network analysis with a little bit about Docker to um, introduce research encapsulation. The materials, the videos, the notebooks, everything is available on Daria campus or will be shortly. You can again find that through our website. <coughs> One of, um, I'm, I'm the work package lead of the communications arm, so I can't necessarily offer a lot of technical expertise. But one of my uh, particular areas is trying to introduce um, introductory infographics, just showing how CLS methods could be of use for different sectors, including policymakers and journalists, but particularly focused on the GLAM sector. So for example, this is part of an infographic video showing how sentiment analysis tools can compare cultural feeling about a subject or a named entity across multiple texts or multiple corpora. With the results, a librarian could curate a special collection to engage with the public, a specific course, an exhibition, for example. And this is part of another, whoops, this is part of a, another um, infographic video uh, targeted toward journalists showing how sentiment, showing how um, the results of CLS analysis can draw out journalistic narratives across large corpora. So we really do think that there is a chance for literary methods to be useful in a number of fields and for almost everyone. So I'm looking forward to hearing more from um, everyone presenting at the LD4 conference and continuing the conversation offline as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Right on time too. <laughs> I just put a note. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the Q&A uh, section and that way we'll answer at the end of the block. Yes. And Tim, I give it over to you. And uh, yeah, I think Manya, I believe you are the next presenter. So please, uh, Put your video on and try to share your screen. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Okay. Uh, can you see my uh, screen? Not, oh yeah, here it comes. Uh, I think now it's okay, yes. Yes, it looks great. And um, if you'd like to give us a quick, um, Quick introduction to yourself before you get into, you know, just okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, of course. Uh, I'm Mania um, Hajari. I'm from Iran and I study uh, digital humanity, uh, Master of Digital Humanity in the uh, University of Bologna in Italy. Uh, and uh, what I uh, um, made for this uh, seminar is a linked data journey into foral poetry. Foral, uh, and uh, you can see the uh, a slide here. Uh, first of all, I want to start with uh, the question of, I know all of you know about this, but what is the link open data 
actually this is a way to organize data so it can be easily connected and share across different websites or platform um, and why load is um, important uh, Manya could you um, uh, go into slideshow mode so on the upper right of your screen push that because we're seeing your we're seeing like the the pre not just the slide but everything else around it yes perfect that so uh just a minute no yes you can you can see the whole uh, slide yes that looks great okay um so uh why uh link comment okay Open data is important for digital humanity because it helps to connect the different type of information uh, and make it easier to explore and discover new connections. For digital humanity, it means scholars can access and study literature, history, and culture in a more integrated way. Uh, Persian literature uh, and the need for uh, link open data. Uh, why? Uh, what is the challenges in Persian <clears throat> literature and how link open, open uh, data can help in this field? Um, Persian literature is very old and very rich and with many texts, stories and poems, uh, but the data is usually uh, scattered and uh, sometimes not digitalized and digitalized and not un, um, and uh, unorganized. So researchers often find it hard to connect historical, cultural and literature information because the data isn't linked. Um, so how uh, link open data can help with this uh, field? With load, we can link different pieces of Persian literature, making the data more organized and easier to search. Uh, this would help a scholar and a student or common people find connections between different texts, author, and historical events. Uh, so why I choose for Faroqsa? Because uh, she's uh, one of the most important uh, poets of uh, Iran and uh, because she was a modernist and avant-garde uh, poet that um, until now any data analysis uh, had not been done before on her poems. Uh, so uh, four poems uh, are deeply connected to Persian culture, history and society. Uh, and they references my uh, many um, historical events, personal experience, and uh, uh, so other things. And um, her work is ideal for applying a link open, open data because we can link these references to a broader culture and historical data, giving a deeper understanding of her poetry. Uh, as you can see, this is a map of uh, her uh, official translated books in the world. And uh, in uh, my website, we can, uh, we can see the uh, um, data about uh, his, uh, her um, uh, translated books. And uh, now how uh, link open data can improve the study of folks' poetry. Uh, using Lord, we can connect them, teams and um, people and events uh, mentioned in her poetry to real world, uh, uh, such as historical events or cultural symbols. For example, we can link her poems uh, to a specific places in Iran. Um, or for example, for uh, or social movements and important social movements in her time. Um, Um, by uh, linking the, her work uh, with other data, researchers can discover new patterns, such as how her poetry evolved over time or how it connects uh, with other uh, Persian literature works. Um, Uh, in the SF Lord website, this is a website I created for uh, link open data on Foro Farmstad. And this is actually a practical application. We can uh, we select from, because uh, this is a limited work. Uh, we select an 
some some 10 important actually 10 important items and uh, i create a knowledge organization um, part for uh, this 10 uh, important item of her life and her poetry uh, for example we have a conceptual map uh, like what you can see here uh, the green notes uh, you can see all of this in the website um, all green uh, nodes in graph uh, represent the items, the 10 items I chose, uh, while the blue nodes represent important event, plays, and people related to the main object that is there for a paragraph. And then we have ER model, uh, and um, I have to switch to, uh, sorry. Uh, I have to switch to the website. You can you can see actual website and the ten uh, items we uh, select, and then all the maps actually come uh, like conceptual map and ER model, and all metadata that uh, we choose uh, based on uh, some standard and. Uh, the sources of this metadata um, and for a recap because we uh, don't have any time uh, link open data is a powerful tool for uh, studying Persian literature all type of literature uh, but uh, in this case Persian lit literature um, by connecting her um, the photo poem to historical culture and social data, Lord can make it easier to explore the uh, the deeper meaning of her work and its connection to Persian history and society. Uh, thank you for uh, your time, and I am here if you have any question. Uh, I will stop sharing okay well thank you so much and we're holding questions to the end we did get um a question in the chat that you could maybe uh answer uh while the next talk is going on asking for the github url for your projects um and thank you. uh feel free to use the q a or uh to uh to ask questions we will compile questions for all of the speakers at the end um, so Perry, where did Perry go? Uh, I'm here. <laughs> hold on. I don't know why I don't see you um, as a panelist, but uh, you, you're able to share to screen share and uh, and turn on your audio and video, right? It looks like it. Yes. Right. You can hear me, right? <laughs> yes. I'm good. You. Okay. Okay. Great. One second. Harry will be giving a lightning talk entitled uh, Grant Funding for Linked Humanities Data. And uh, once you get your slides up, just uh, give, your, give a quick one sentence bio um, to start the talk off. One second. Oh. I'm just sharing now. Great. Great. Yes, we see your screen now and you are in presenter mode. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you all for joining and to all of my fellow panelists. This has already been a great conference and we've just gotten started. So I'm Perry Collins. I am a senior program officer in the Office of Digital Humanities at the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, and I started at the NEH in 2011 um, and was there for a few years and um, then went and worked in academic libraries. So I've actually only been back at the NEH for about nine months or so. Um, but I was at, at Ball State University and the University of Florida Libraries. Um, and a big part of my job now is to continue really keeping my finger on the pulse of some of the trends happening um, in digital humanities and libraries. Um, and we work closely with our colleagues at the Institute of Museum and Library Services as well. So today I'm just going to highlight um, a little bit about some of the opportunities that we have for funding. Um, I apologize in advance, this, this is really very much directed at 
our U.S. colleagues, but I do have a little bit to say at the end about international collaboration, which is something we're really interested in and excited about. So I hope everyone um, will keep that in mind. For those who don't know, NEH is an independent federal agency, and we're the largest government humanities funder in the United States. So that doesn't include private foundations like the Mellon Foundation that, of course, have funded this community and many other um, projects in this space. We were founded in 1965, along with our sister agency, the National Endowment for the Arts, to support the study and interpretation of disciplines like literature, history, et cetera. So our colleagues at the NEA focus more on creativity and sort of the creation and performance of art, um, whereas we focus more on analysis and interpretation for a lot of different kinds of audiences. I always like to highlight that from the outset, um, there was a lot of interest at the NEH um, in what we then called computer-oriented humanistic research. Um, so that was something that was in our very first call for proposals in 1966. Um, and obviously, there have been different trends throughout the years um, in terms of how we've engaged with that. But this is something that we've had um, kind of on our plates since the very beginning. And this is this photo is of our, our offices at the Constitution Center in D.C. So I definitely wanted to highlight a couple of things that we funded. Um, we have a public awards database, and I'll link to that in a moment. Um, but we actually have quite a few different projects that you can look through, and maybe some folks here on this call have been funded before by the NEH for their work. Um, I think back to um, 2011 as not necessarily the first time we were funding some of these methods or technologies, but probably the first year where we really started to fund linked data as a community of practice, um, where we kind of heard it articulated that way. Um, I was lucky enough in my first year on the job to attend the Linked Ancient World Data Institute at NYU. Um, and I was so impressed while I was there, I remember, with just how much excitement and collaboration was already going on. And since then, that work has just sort of blossomed from that community, just as one example, um, where they really have um, done a lot of publication and projects and received additional funding over the years for different things. But to fast forward, um, we've continued to fund a lot of this work as it's become um, kind of more sophisticated and advanced over time. Um, and there are two projects that I chose to highlight today, um, both funded in 2022 and still ongoing. So one is Metapolis, um, which is an award to Harvard University for an in-development research platform that's kind of taking maps, primary sources, named entities, and finding ways to link up that data um, to really be able to document all the work that's going into these projects. Um, and then second is the Wayfinder project. This is a, an effort led at Emory University um, that really is a digitization project, but because they're working with um, a print bibliography, it really lends itself to linked data. So that's become a major component of the project. Um, and that was a planning award. Um, so just starting to get um, work done on the ground for that. So I'm going to talk briefly about two funding opportunities, but I'm going to put in the chat a few links to our records for the projects I just mentioned and to the programs I'm talking about now. So first is our Digital Humanities Advancement Grants Program. Um, and I should say from the outset that both of these programs are kind of the bread and butter programs um, that are funding a lot of linked open data um, related work. There are other programs at the agency from fellowships to institutes to um, research and development, lots of opportunities depending on the project. So I always encourage you to reach out to a program officer. We try to be as approachable as we possibly can. Um, but these are the two that probably stand out the most when you see what's been funded in the past. So our Digital Humanities Advancement Grants Program there is a real emphasis in this program on experimentation, on risk, on really pushing methodological boundaries. Um, and that doesn't mean reinventing the wheel or that we expect every single thing to be new and innovative and shiny all the time, but it does mean building on what's come before to do something else. Um, there's a real focus on methods, on tools and platforms, and on thinking about reuse for wider communities. So whatever specific project you might be working on, how might it be adapted and useful to others? 
There are three tiers of funding, um, ranging from $75,000 for kind of early planning to $350,000 for full-fledged implementation. Um, and this program funded the Harvard Metropolis Project I just mentioned. So again, thinking about a research platform, taking um, infrastructure that's already there, but doing something else with it. It's a good example. Second is the Humanities Collections and Reference Resources Program. This sits within our Division of Preservation and Access. Um, and they fund about 35 projects a year. Um, the deadline for this is in July. Um, and this pro program really focuses on established best practices. How do we really focus on, um, thanks for the time check, um, how do we really focus on using what's already out there, something we know how to do? Um, so digitization is something that we see commonly in this program. Um, but as linked data work has become more and more embedded in some of those best practices, um, and we really have come up with guidelines for a lot of this work, we're seeing more and more of that fall into this program. And that's really exciting to me because it means a broader swath of the agency is supporting this community. Um, and that fun funding has both planning and implementation. So finally, I wanna wrap up by mentioning international collaboration. So NEH welcomes proposals that focus on global challenges and collections. Um, we have a really wonderful dynamic chair right now, Shelley Lowe, who's an Indigenous Studies scholar um, and has really emphasized partnerships, um, which is, is honestly a lot of fun for us as program officers. Um, we have a kind of rotating list of different formal programs where we might partner with different funders. Um, for instance, my office recently did a partnership with the AHRC in the UK. Um, but I'd say more often we see um, individual projects that have an international focus or have experts from outside the United States. Um, and we are very happy to fund honoraria, to fund consultants. Um, there are limitations in terms of how we can give our money away to non-US institutions. But again, if you ever have questions on that, please feel free to get in touch and we can help you navigate. And I'll just conclude by saying thank you again. Um, please do get on our website. You'll see probably too much information, honestly, sometimes on the website. So you can always get in touch with somebody. Um, I've put our office's email address here, odh at neh.gov. Um, oh, and I should have said for the programs I mentioned, we're also happy to take inquiries, to read drafts. Um, so we really are, um, we are, you know, there to take your questions as, as you have them. So. All right, thank you so much, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for that. Uh, there was a ton of great information in that talk, uh, Perry. And now we are going to uh, sh uh, move into the final lightning talk of this block. Um, so Rose McCandless, uh, who is an MLIS student at the University of Denver and the Manuscript Data Curation Graduate Fellow at Digital Scriptorium, which is part of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Rose researches medieval manuscripts within their medieval and modern contexts, and so Rose is going to give a talk entitled um, uh, Bridging the Digital Scriptorium Data Model and Wikidata to Expand Reuse of Manuscript Metadata. So Rose, uh, please take it away. Thank you. Um, can you see my screen okay? You can see your screen, um, and now, yes, it's in full screen now, so it looks awesome. great. Fabulous. Uh, good morning, everyone. So um, thank you so much for the introduction, Tim. Um, I'll just get started. So due to the complex and unique nature of manuscripts as handwritten objects, there exists no standard cataloging methodology for manuscripts. Institutional metadata contributed to the Digital Scriptorium or DS catalog, an online union catalog uh, built in Wikibase that aggregates manuscript records from institutions across North America, varies in robustness of description, encoding formats, and other elements of data organization. When an institution contributes their manuscript metadata to the DS catalog, our team enriches and reconciles the data to contribute to the linked data environment and promote increased discoverability for our member institutions' manuscript objects. The DS catalog, therefore, 
enables the harmonization of diverse institutional descriptions and the broader linked data environment, which includes Wikidata, an open crowdsourced global database for structuring data. Out of a desire for increased discoverability and data reusability, my team at DS developed a crosswalk from the DS catalog to Wikidata to address issues of interoperability between metadata schemas and vocabularies by matching semantically equivalent or similar elements or values. In order to upload manuscript records from the DS catalog to Wikidata, we identified ways to map the DS data model and the manuscript records and data values found in the DS catalog to Wikidata. We used, as the basis for the crosswalk that is the primary result of this project, the Wiki Project Manuscripts Data Model, which outlines basic guidelines for entering manuscript objects into Wikidata. The project was developed by two classicists with a focus on early Greek manuscripts, so naturally the crosswalk to the DS catalog required some additional detail and adjustment to reflect the diversity of the manuscripts contained within. Our process began by addressing initial discrepancies between properties and functions of metadata elements in the DS catalog and wiki project manu Wiki Project Manuscripts Data Model, which I began mapping in a spreadsheet that I developed specifically for this purpose, highlighting the DS properties and their approximate matches in Wikidata with qualifications noted where appropriate. This was followed by manual entry of manuscripts into Wikidata using our adjusted model based on Wiki Project Manuscripts. We then went through several rounds of revision to the crosswalk documentation as new issues and discrepancies arose, one of which I will detail in a moment. Once we were happy with the manual entry process, we began recently performing small mass uploads of entries into Wikibase via OpenRefine, which is presenting new issues uh, that we are currently working to address. A useful example of the type of adaptation that was required when mapping the DS data model onto the Wiki project's manuscripts data model is the formulation of time and dates. Regarding the dates of production for a manuscript object, the Wiki project manuscripts data model recommends using the Wikidata property inception, which is P571, which represents the time when an entity begins to exist. The major limitation of this property when it comes to accurately reporting manuscript metadata is that inception as a property is intended to have a single point in time as its contents. This point in time can take three forms, a single date, for example, 1468, a decade, for example, the 1460s, or a century, for example, the 15th century. A great number of manuscript objects are described by metadata, however, that does not conform to the requirements of the inception property. Some manuscripts have been dated by scholarship to a period that is larger than a decade, but smaller than a century, yet cannot responsibly be condensed or expanded to be associated solely with one of those time periods. For example, a book of hours produced from between the period of 1425 to 1475. Additionally, many manuscripts are dated within a time period that is larger than a century, for example, circa 1300 to 1500. Two solutions, therefore, were identified to address these issues. For the first issue, in which a manuscript has a range of possible production dates within a single century, we felt it appropriate to use the inception property infilled with the century in which the range of dates sits. For the example given above, then, the inception property would be filled by 15th century, or in the example on the screen, 16th century. Inception dates are then given the qualifiers earliest date and latest date, which represent the terminus postquem and terminus antiquem, respectively, and can accurately represent the range of possible production dates associated with a manuscript in a way that fits with Wikidata's data model. Earliest date and latest date are both intended to serve as qualifiers to other Wikidata properties, such as inception. The second issue, that of manuscripts whose possible production dates span more than a single century, the example I gave above being 1300 to 1500 or circa 1788 to 1849, posed greater difficulty. Inception only supports a single century as for each value, 
and does not support a range greater than a century as a single value. But because inception is clearly the property best suited to creation date metadata, we settled on an imperfect solution. The two centuries that are given as part of the range of possible production dates in the manuscript should be entered as separate values under inception, with the qualifiers earliest date and latest date used under separate values. In the example below and shown on the screen, the manuscript's production date was given in the metadata as 1788 to 1849. Thus, under inception, both 18th century and 19th century were provided as values, and under 18th century, the earliest date is given as 1788, and under 19th century, the latest date is given as 1849. This solution appears to allow for the most accurate representation of the possible date range provided in the manuscript metadata for instances of ranges spanning multiple centuries. Within Wikidata, however, an entry formatted in this way is flagged by a single best value constraint warning, which states that when multiple values are entered under inception, one value should be assigned a preferred rank. Although there are circumstances in which this is appropriate, the present situation represents a range of dates with equal or non-hierarchical probability of being the date of the manuscript's production, and it would thus be inappropriate to refer to one century or date over another in accurately representing the metadata and scholarship. This is a problem with the entry of manuscript metadata into Wikidata that does not at this time have a clear solution. Many manuscripts in the DS catalog have multiple values in the production date fields, typically a more specific date or range of dates followed by the century. This is an instance in which the preferred rank required by the inception property is useful. One can enter all of the provided values for production date under inception, marking the most specific or agreed upon date as the preferred, but leaving the other dates to allow for greater discovery. In the example shown on the screen, 1464 is marked as preferred, as it is the most specific date of production provided in the metadata, but 15th century is still included to allow for the discovery of the manuscript in, for example, a Sparkle query looking for manuscripts with 15th century production dates. This is but one example of the challenges presenting themselves in adapting our institutional data model, describing objects that are unique and described to varying levels of depth, to increase discoverability in a linked data environment that is not designed for manuscript objects specifically. As we at DS continue to work towards a crosswalk that will enable the smooth entry of our records into Wikidata, we value input from other linked data specialists, and I look forward to your questions and thoughts. My contact information is available on the screen. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much to all of our, to Rose and to Manya, Sarah, and Perry uh, for those excellent lightning talks. I know we uh, have a question in the Q&A, um, and I think something's come from the Slack, but feel free to use the Q&A to ask some questions or the Slack. Um, we have about 20 minutes allotted for questions. So, uh, Laura Ackerman asks uh, for Manya, how might your work be carried forward into tools for other researchers in collaborative work? Manya, are you able to, to or Maida, are you, you're, are you able to answer that or unmute and, and answer? Okay. Um, all right. Then I see in the chat, um, Sarah. So there, this is a question across uh, across uh, lightning talkers. So Sarah Hoover was curious, uh, Perry, if you can give any good any examples of good digitization projects that deal with archiving and analysis of current data, particularly multimodal data. 
Yeah, that's why I love virtual talks because I could actually go and think about this and find an example and a link while everyone else was talking. Um, so yeah, Sarah, that was a good question. Um, the one that came to mind for me is a project at the University of Maryland that's focusing on broadcast data. So I'm putting the project link um, in the chat, the Broadcasting Audiovisual Data Project. Um, and this I love as an example because NEH funded both sort of um, a digitization project at the beginning, Unlocking the Airwaves, um, through the Humanities Collections and Reference Resources Program, and then the Broadcasting Audiovisual Data Project, which is building on that, was funded through an advancement grant. So it's a good example of how two steps of an overarching project kind of complement one another. That sounds fascinating. Uh, yeah. And uh, Richard Urban has a question for Sarah. I believe this was the same question that was asked in Slack. So thank you for uh, dropping in in both spaces, Richard. Um, so Richard would like to um, uh, ask uh, if CLS is interested in any kind of entity extraction that is often useful in other linked open data, for example, extracting a list of fictional characters from a work as person entities, extraction of fictional places in their relation to real world places. Yeah, good question. And absolutely. <clears throat> um, I get to give several projects that our transnational access fellows, which are a four to six week fellowship, have done that are, are doing um, like a sentiment analysis of a fictional character uh, across several works within a, a single, it was actually Jane Austen's um, corpora, and how they feel about Bristol. Um, and then comparing it to similar sentiment analysis out of the author's um, letters. So that becomes this really interesting, complex question. And all of that data is now available. Great. So yeah, definitely. Um, the extraction of any kind of named entity is, um, that would be our Ghent University work package is doing most of that work as well as the sentiment analysis. So if you send me an email, I'd be happy to connect you to um, Tess Dejaher, who's heading that particular area. Okay, and Sarah, is, is your um, email available to, uh, in the chat or on SCED? Great, thank you so much. Um, I will I will forward that to uh, I'm going to copy that into the regular ch to the everyone chat. Thank you so much. And I see that uh, Darnell Melvin uh, has a question. I think this is perhaps for Rose. Um, so it's in the Q and A. Um, so why was the decision to put date range in multiple statements? I thought the best practice was like this example and, uh, you know, with a link out to specific, uh, Q item and wiki data, um, maybe I could share my screen and Rose, you could, um, talk through that one. It's, I know it's always yeah. a little absolutely five, uh, but let me get the screen share going yeah it's a great question um the very simple answer um honestly is that we there are such a diverse range of how potential production dates can be represented um in the manuscript metadata alone um which includes the fact that the creation of a manuscript, my particular specialty being medieval manuscripts, but the DS catalog represents manuscripts from um, any and all world traditions, um, is that a manuscript also doesn't have to be created in a single instance. It could be created primarily in the 13th century and then added to in the 15th century. Um, it really depends on the object. And the wiki project manuscripts data model, um, which was developed by 
um, two fantastic classicists. Um, and then, which, as I mentioned, we used as our model, does recommend using the inception property as the um, kind of foundation property for entering production date. And a main reason for that is that inception is the only property whose definition and purpose and kind of scope statements seem to fit most accurately to manuscripts. Um, we also examined production date as a potential property to use, but production date um, in its definition on Wikidata is pretty specifically geared towards more modern productions uh, like films and that kind of thing, published works. Um, and in terms of putting the date range in multiple statements, um, we, as I mentioned in the talk, we settled on an imperfect solution because it was frankly the solution that yielded the least number of kind of warnings and flags from Wikidata. Um, it, you know, date of birth is a is a fantastic example um, of best practice and how that's been structured in Wikidata. The problem is kind of entering manuscripts into Wikidata is only something that has really been examined by this Wiki project manuscripts project project, um, as well as the project that it was based on, which is Biblissima. Um, and we decided to settle on kind of the most general possible solution that could be adapted to fit a lot of different production circumstances for these uh, highly unique objects. Okay, great. That was a very comprehensive response. Uh, I see that we're getting a few more Oh, uh, and then Darnell shares in the Q&A uh, a great resource on dates. So, uh, which I think applies to, you know, helping anyone using Wikidata figure out what type of date properties might be the most appropriate. All right. Uh, and uh, just as a note, Sarah Hoover had to leave to go somewhere else. Um, uh, so, but she did note that you can email her if you have any uh, additional questions about her presentation. Um, and let's see.